There are three things that I would like to accomplish today in our, in our time together. One of those is to love on you. This is why we're here. We're here to love on each other and to know that that's really genuine and really deep. I received a text message from a couple that been a part of our church for quite some time and they have been traveling lately and not able to be in attendance. So they texted me just so I would know that they're fine, they're watching online, their travels are about over and they're gonna be here and they didn't want me to be worried and wanted me to know of their love. They specifically expressed their love for me. It warmed my heart. And I was able then to just respond and say, hey, this is mutual. Love you guys too. That's what we're here for. We're here to love on each other. And I want one of the takeaways today, my hope is that you would feel deeply loved by God, most importantly, Jesus who came to die for us. We're going to receive communion at the end of our gathering here today to remember what he did for us. It's to remember how much he loves us, that someone would love us so much that he would give up his very life for us that we could have it. Love, love is what we're here for. God's love, each other, that we would truly express our love for each other. That's part of my prayer. Another thing that I would like to accomplish today is to encourage you, like whatever the battle, whatever the challenge that you might face, that you can be encouraged, that it's gonna be okay, you're gonna get through it. In fact, in this theme of restored in the book of Nehemiah today, the focus is ready for anything. We're ready for anything. We don't know what's coming tomorrow. No one can, but we're ready for anything. Hopefully it's great, enjoyable, good. If it's a challenge, we're ready for that too. God gives us the ability by his grace and through knowing him and through being connected to others like we are here, that we're ready for anything. When I go through challenges, I have people that are walking through them with me. I'm not alone. I feel like I am ready for anything because I'm not alone in the journey. That's a big part of why we're here today, to encourage you that you are ready for anything. And then a third thing, to love, to inspire, and then, or to love, to encourage, and the third thing is to inspire. I'm, I'm prayerful that I can inspire you, inspire myself about the future, that the future is filled with unbelievable possibilities and promises and that we should be excited about tomorrow. Not worried about it, not depressed about it, not feeling like this is so bad, what's going on around us that we don't even wanna face it, but rather inspired that even when things are bad, we're here to make it different. We're here by God's grace to live into that dark place and turn light on in the darkness to inspire one another about the future that is really filled with incredible possibilities. And then with that, as we jump in here in a moment, we're gonna look at chapter seven of Nehemiah. It's an ongoing story of the regathering of the people of Israel back into their hometown, back into family relationship and friendship. We have had more tragedy happen in our world that speaks about the brokenness and the darkness of it. And I find myself debating with myself to speak to it or not. I don't think it's necessary for me to speak to every uh, current event that goes on in the world. But there are times it feels like it's a pastoral responsibility. It's, it's a, something that's heavy on the hearts of all of us. And those are the things that I feel like it's good for me to at least speak to briefly. And with the tragedy that we've watched unfold with Tyree Nichols losing his life in Memphis and having that played out in front of us and so many different sides to stories of this kind, to find out that Tyree was a resident of Sacramento up until 2020 when he moved to Memphis where his mother lives and he's made a new start there working for a good company and finding his way in life. When he was here in Sacramento, he was a part of a Bible study group. He was a skateboarder and would often 
help kids at the skate parks and gather to study the Bible with some of them. And so just learning more about his history and his life is good for us because he's part of our fabric of our community. And then to know that, you know, this kind of tragedy that happens in the world, it affects people different ways. And I know for one, I have a great love in my heart for all of us that are here. And I have a deep love in my heart for diversity and a deep love in my heart for how we come together in this house to be one, no matter our background. And we sure have a wide ranging background. We come from Europe. We come from Latin America. We come from Africa. We come from the native land of this land. We, we come from Asian continent. We, we come from so many places and here we are all together, one humanity, one people. And I know that my black and brown brothers and sisters feel the pain of situations like this that seem to be another in the story of trial and challenge and systemic burdens that occur. And then when it's at the hand of black police officers, it seems to even complicate the conversation a little bit more. And so it's not my intent to speak into my opinions about it, but to simply offer care and c concern and love and say, if you're hurting today by what you've experienced and seen, and there are systemic challenges that go with how these things affect us in different ways. There are others who it doesn't seem to affect at all or even can develop a negative view that we would even address it. We're here for all of that. And we're here for everyone. And we're here to become one in Christ. And to know that God cares about you and what you're going through and how these things affect you and impact you. And what I feel in my heart is the inspiration that we're here to make a difference. We're here to make this a land that all can dwell together in unity and not be fearful of what might transpire in their life tomorrow based on skin color or any other issue of life that we're here together to find our way to promise and to blessing and to possibility. That's God's plan and his purpose for us. Napoleon described a leader as a dealer in hope. We're hope dealers. We're here to say we've got something for you and it will help you. It's all about hope that tomorrow can be better than today. The future is far more promising than the past. Nehemiah fits this description. He's a dealer in hope. Before the work began, he inspired the people by assuring them that God would prosper their efforts. When they were afraid, he prayed that God would strengthen them. When they, the enemy threatened them, Nehemiah stood his ground and called the bluff of the enemy, knowing that the people were gonna come together and thwart the efforts of their adversaries. When the work was completed in 52 days, it was a great testimony to the fact that what can be done together is beyond description. What can be done together defies the odds. What can be done together makes it possible for you to take incremental steps forward in your own personal journey because you're not alone and you've got someone encouraging you, someone praying for you, someone helping you, someone that even in the network of relationships we have may have an opportunity that opens a door for you. We're here for each other. We're here for the future of everybody in this house and we're here to change this community. When I think about the burdens that exist when I drive down the street, every day that I come to work, driving down Micron Avenue, the frontage road to the freeway to get here, I pass tents on the side leaning up against the fence, three, four, tents right down this road from where we are. And I think at times to myself, what am I doing? I'm driving by. I'm concerned at times, yet don't know what to do. And that's just this road getting to work. 
If I go over the freeway to Folsom Boulevard and head down to get on the freeway at Watt Avenue, I pass tent cities leaning up against fences under the bridge of the overpass. It's, it's mind boggling, it's staggering, it's sometimes even depressing, it, it affects me and it's like, it's a blight on our community for one too. I feel all those things, I'm like, come on, can't we do better than this? And then I dial it back to think about there's souls in those tents, there's people living there night after night when we're going through two, three weeks of torrential downpours, which we got past apparently and having beautiful days like we've had, but realizing that people are under these elements. And I think about the souls that are there. And at times I feel like I'm not doing enough. One of the visions that I still have in my heart is what God can help us to do together. We're connected to services and resources that God can help us to redouble our efforts. I have it in my heart to think that somehow God can place us in relationship with those in authority that we can give advice to, that we can partner with to find solutions. There's so much money available for these problems. There's so much desire. Many of our politicians want to make a difference. They do, I'm convinced of it. It's not like they don't care. Everybody wants to do something and yet all of the efforts that we are trying to make happen aren't coming together. There's gotta be a way through that. I have a feeling and a vision in my heart that God may wanna use us, the people of faith, to use the faith community to come into this environment in the times that we're in and still move that ball forward. I'm only speaking vision to you today. I don't know what those answers are. I'm thinking there must be some around the country we can glean from. We don't have to reinvent the wheel, but we do need to do something to change the world because there's people that are desperately in need of it. And when we can come together, we can rebuild the walls. We've had some walls torn down. We we need to figure out a way to make it safe for people to live here. Safe for people to find jobs here. Safe for people to find mental health resources and addiction resources to get them free from the things that are hindering them and bogging them down. Life has crushed people all around us and God is here to lift that burden and to cause their life to flourish again. It's possible for people to come out of desperate situations into life. That's going to happen. I still see it in my heart. I have a vision of it in my soul. Nehemiah chapter seven and verse one. Now when the wall had been built and I had set up the doors and the gatekeepers, the singers and the Levites had been appointed, I gave my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the governor of the castle, charge over Jerusalem, for he was a more faithful and God-fearing man than many. And I said to them, let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot. And while they are still standing guard, let them shut and bar the doors, appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, some at their guard posts and some in front of their own homes. The city was wide and large, but the people within it were few and no houses had been rebuilt. People were still coming back because they weren't safe there until the walls were built. Then my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles and the officials and the people to be enrolled by genealogy. And I found the book of the genealogy of those who came up at the first and I found written in it, these were the people of the province who came up out of the captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon had carried into exile. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah each to his town. In these few verses, in this ongoing saga of the rebuilding of the walls that had been torn down, come a new spirit of vision, that there's hope that the people that have been beaten down, the people that have been placed into captivity are now free and they can come back into their home. As of yet, The town has few people in it, but now it's safe. Now there's time to get the people back. Now there are guards at the gates. Now there are watchers on the wall. 
watchmen making sure they will be safe for the people. And then he says, I'm actually going to call together the nobles and the officials. I'm going to get the politicians together. Here's what happens when God begins to do something great. It will get the attention of everyone. I don't have in my spirit the feeling like there's some kind of a, of a barrier that needs to exist between the world and the church. If we're doing the work of God rightly, we're going to be so winsome in our relationship to the people of this world and to the politicians and to those who make decisions in the halls of our legislature that we're going to be invited in. We're going to be wanted in because we have in our heart the desire not to condemn, the desire not to do destruction to anyone, but to say, hey, if you've been hurt, there's a healing for you. If you've been put down, there's someone that will lift you up. Jesus is here for the downtrodden. He's here for the broken. He's here for every human soul, no matter what their lifestyle has been. Jesus is here to redeem and to restore, and he's done that for you, and he'll do that for the person down the street. And just because we're safe in here doesn't mean that the person that's not safe out there can't come in. It's time for the church to be able to embrace the society that we live in and not think that this whole system is our enemy. No, these souls are targets of God's grace and of his love and we're here to build bridges. We're here to make a difference. We're here to say, we're here to love on this community. What do I have in my heart today? I have love. I have love for you. I have love for those who are hard to love. I have love in my heart for the people I drive by on Micron, for the people I drive by on Folsom Boulevard. I have love in my heart for them. That should translate into some kind of action. When we come together and we discover his plan, he'll show us what to do and he'll link us up with the nobles. He'll link us up with those officials that we can say, hey, we're not here to cause you any harm. We're here to help you. We're here to make your job easier and better. We're here to see this world transform And God is the one who is our source of life to make that happen. We're created for family. Never forget that, we're created for family. God created us for fellowship with him. That's hard to believe. He wanted us to hang with him. He created us for that kind of communion, that kind of joy to have a mutual love relationship with one another. He's expressed his love to us, and because of that, we can express our love back. He loved us first. He initiated his love toward me, and now when I realize what he's done for me, I have it in my heart to love him back, and to make this a mutual communion of family. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and We're called in the scriptures, sons and daughters of God. We're family. God uses family terms when he thinks of us. We're family. We should think of family terms when we think of each other. You're my brother, you're my sister. We're in this world as family together. We're not distant. We're we're not separated. We are united by the same bloodline, the bloodline of Jesus that we'll celebrate here in a moment. His blood that was shed for us to remove all of our sins. When we receive Jesus, we've got an elder brother in Jesus who connects us to the Father in heaven, our heavenly Father. There is no fatherless person in this room. Every one of us has a heavenly Father. And we've got a lot of natural breakdowns in family life, it's a given. We have a lot of stresses in families. Even the best of families have burdens. The best of families have strife and challenges. But we have a God in heaven, our heavenly Father, who's perfect and unites us and has a way of healing us. Even our natural family structures can find healing when we surrender ourselves to God through Jesus and we get united to our elder brother and united to our heavenly Father and suddenly we find forgiveness for those who've hurt us that we never knew was possible. That he gives us a gift for. He gives us a vision for things that we never dreamed we could accomplish. There's a vision he wants to put in our heart because we're family. We need guards at the gate, watchers on the wall. Jeremiah knew it and he prepared for it. 
These are serious times that call for sincere followers who care about the mission and who care about one another. We need to care about the mission of God. The thing that should get us up in the morning is to realize that we're on a mission that is eternal. We're on a mission that's not just about us. It's not just about our own personal welfare. That gets taken care of when we're on track with the mission of God. He'll show us what to do in our own journey. We're on a mission together of love. We're on a mission together to stand together, to care about one another. It's important that you have somebody caring for you. If you don't, we need to find that path quickly. It's important that you have a mission of caring for someone else. If you don't, we need to help get you on that track quickly. We're here to care for each other. It happens all week long. They shared some of the things happening. Wednesday night, we have a prayer gathering right here. First Wednesday prayer and worship. We need prayer like never before to see the transformation of our community. We have an opportunity to care for one another by coming together in that way. There's a, there's a class that happens on Sunday morning, a Bible class in the chapel of being knit together and having fellowship there with other souls. Strengthening your marriage is a class that happens in the parlor every Sunday at nine. What a great place if you're in a married relationship to find fellowship with others that will encourage you to get strong in family life. Places for our kids on Wednesday night, men's and women's groups on Wednesday night. If you don't have someone, it's a, there's opportunities galore to find someone, rooted groups. Financial Peace University to find the strength of wisdom in knowing how to help in financial challenges. We're here for each other, we are family together. Let me skip to the end of this chapter for this reason, because right from where we left off until you get to verse 66, it's a, it's a recitation of a census of all the people that had been dispersed that are coming back name after name and how many from their tribes are coming back. They number them and the numbers actually mount. When we get to verse 66, it's a summary of everything that's gone in the middle of this chapter of all the people that are returning. The whole assembly together was 42,360 besides their male and female servants of whom there were 7,337 and they had 245 singers male and female. Their horses were 736, their mules 245, their camels 435, and their donkeys 6,720. I don't know why all these things are listed. There's just a lot of mess to clean up in that. That might be part of it. There's always gonna be a mess to clean up. My page turned. <laughs> now some of the heads of fathers' houses gave to the work. The governor gave to the treasury 1,000 derricks of gold, 50 basins, 30 priests' garments, and 500 minas of silver. And some of the heads of fathers' houses gave into the treasury of the work 20,000 derricks of gold and 2,200 minas of silver. And what the rest of the people gave was 20,000 derricks of gold, 2,000 miners, miners of silver, and 67 priest garments. It's just a lot of stuff, valuable stuff. The modern day number of that would be like a one ton of silver was given. That, that's a lot of wealth so that the people could come together and take care of each other and the city would flourish. The gold was monumental amount of goods. So the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, some of the people, the temple servants, and all Israel lived in their towns. And when the seventh month had come, the people of Israel were in their towns. It took some time, but the people started coming back in droves. And they're numbering them as they come back. It's time for us to make sure that we have room for everyone to come back. May they all come back. We've been scattered. We've had challenges. People have gone other places. 
There's an opportunity to come back together to say God wants us to be renewed. He wants us to have love in our heart for each other. He wants us to be encouraged that no matter what we're going through, he's got it handled and taken care of. We're ready for anything. And to know that we can be inspired, that the future is far greater than the past. Whatever challenge you have right now is going to be overcome by having vision for miracles that are on the horizon, for life change, for solving homeless issues in this community, for finding people that are in poverty that have an ability to get a job and find their way through it into success and prosperity. To see that no matter what ethnicity someone has come from and no matter what the burdens have been and some of the systemic issues that cause some to not have the same opportunity as another, that that gets taken care care of by the love that we have for one another and how we treat everybody the same. And in the house of God, everybody is equal in God's sight. And it doesn't matter how much money we have. And it doesn't matter what neighborhood we live in. It doesn't matter what challenges we're going through. It doesn't matter what our sin life has been over the last five years, 10 years, or one week. That Jesus is here to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. That's why we're here. That we know we need his grace to come over us. And we're not dismissing sin like it doesn't matter. No, we're recognizing that it's harsh. It tears down. It tears us down. And we're here to say, God, thank you for redeeming me from sin. Thank you that your grace covers me and renews me. Thank you that that guilt and shame is washed away in your presence and that you give me the power to grow and that together we can conquer the enemy who has tried to come against us. For no matter what the enemy has done to do harm to God's people, God is able to accomplish his purposes. He is calling us to follow him. No matter what the enemy has done to do harm to you, God's person, God's people, God is able to accomplish his purposes. He will do it in spite of the challenge. Sometimes he will do it through the challenge, because of the challenge. It's gonna work out something good in your life. When you go through hardships, God will turn it into wonderful blessings. No matter what we go through, God will turn it into something good for his purpose. He is calling us to follow him. I'm gonna follow him all the days of my life. And as we do that, we're gonna dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let me finish with this thought and we're gonna receive communion. These are what lessons Nehemiah teaches us in this chapter. People are important to God. People are important to God. It almost sounds silly to say it. Like really, that's as deep as it gets today? Well, maybe, maybe. There's some people that aren't feeling it. Some people that wonder, do I matter? Does God care? This is a life lesson Nehemiah teaches. People are important to God, every single person. Every single person is important to God. And we don't need to, we we don't need to decide which ones are and which ones aren't. He decides that everyone is important to him. And no matter what someone is going through, his grace covers. We can rebuild anything that has been torn down. This is a life lesson. We can rebuild anything that has been torn down. There have been people that have been through so many hardships and been broken down so many times and yet coming back to God, his grace is able to renew us, restore us, make us something better than we could ever have dreamed. This is what he does. He restores anything that's been torn down. God keeps track of his followers. Here there's a census of all the people coming back and they're numbered, how many of them? How how many horses have they got? How many donkeys? How how many this and that? They're all numbered. He keeps track and he knows about everyone. Nobody's lost to him. Nobody's like out of sight. God will always keep his work moving forward. That's what he's about. He has said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He said, I, I will, God will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We as people need to come together in assurance that our God is doing a great and mighty work and there's nothing to fear about the future. He's got it all under control. 
We are ready for whatever comes our way because we serve a great and mighty God. And remember that we're family forever. We're family forever, forever. From here to eternity and through it. Jesus, we thank you for your love for us, that your grace covers us today. We pray that in this moment, we will be loved on, encouraged and inspired by your word that there's a great day coming. There's a day of miracles waiting. There's a day of healing right around the corner. There's a day of victory. There's a day of restoration. Show us that day in the vivid picture in our minds. We trust you for that.